With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. Our primary focus today is the statement that Mother Mary made back in verse 5. Listen to it again. Whatever He, speaking of Jesus, whatever He says to you, do it. Now, these are less than 10 words in English translations of the Bible. In fact, in the New American Standard, it's only seven little words. Whatever He says to you, do it. But you would find an ocean of theological truth in the little teacup of this one verse. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, child of God, here's some good advice. Just do it. Now, I want to take these seven words apart, almost one by one, and put them back together and see the best advice that any mother has ever, ever given. In fact, it's the best advice that any father could ever give. It's the best advice that any person could ever give. And frankly, it's the best advice any person could ever receive. Whatever Jesus Christ says to you, whatever the Son of the Most High God tells you to do, you'd be well advised to simply do it. Now, as we look at this best advice any mother ever gave, there are three things that I want us to consider this morning. Note with me, first of all, what I've labeled the scope of this advice. How vast, how broad is this advice? We're honing in on chapter 2 and verse 5. Mary simply says, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, this word whatever is an all-inclusive word. In fact, this word is actually used by the Apostle John later in John 4, verse 14. When Jesus is by the Jacob's well outside the village of Sychar, and an immoral woman comes looking for water. And Jesus says to her in that text, whosoever, that's actually the same word translated whatever in today's passage. Whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give shall never thirst again. I'm telling you this word whatever is as broad and as vast as the message of the gospel itself. John uses a similar word in John 3, 16 and says that whosoever will believe on Jesus shall not perish but have everlasting life. That means anybody and everybody that believes can be saved. Uh, Joshua is told this word in Joshua 1, 9. God said, if you obey my words that I give you, then I will be with you wherever you go. That word wherever means anywhere and everywhere. But here in this case, it's not whoever and it's not wherever, but it's whatever. And this means anything and everything that Jesus tells you to do, brother, you'd be well advised, sister, you'd be well advised to just flat do it with no exceptions, no limitations, no boundaries. I'm talking about the scope of this advice. Whatever he says to you, do it. Now, we look at this story, and that tells us a couple of things about the vast scope of this maternal advice. First, we should obey God and do what Jesus tells us, no matter how crazy it seems. No matter how crazy it seems. If you think about it, this was a rather unusual advice. Because the text tells us that this miraculous transformation of water to wine was the first miracle, the first sign that Jesus ever performed. That means that these servants are operating merely on Mary's advice and Jesus' command. They didn't have any of their own personal history to base their action upon. There'd never been the healing of a man born blind. There'd never been the raising of a lame man by the pool of Bethesda. There'd never been any multiplication of fish and bread. There'd been no resurrection of Jairus' daughter. There'd been no peace be still. There'd been no cleansing of the leper. There'd been no strengthening of the lame. They had nothing to base their action on except the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't even tell them what he was going to do. He did not say, if you'll put some water in those water pots, I'll make some wine. And man, we're going to have just a famous encounter of a miracle working power right here. All he said to them was take some water and fill up those water pots. And they did what Jesus told them to do. You know, throughout the pages of the Bible, the command of God has often made very little sense to our finite human mind. But I'm telling you, friend, when you obey it and you get to the other side of it, you'll see it was great advice to do whatever God told you to do. 
I bet it didn't make any sense to uh, the Israelites when Moses said, here's what's going to happen. The death angel is coming tonight, and you need to take the blood of a spotless lamb and apply it to the doorpost of your house. But brother and sister, for those who did it, they came out saved on the other side. I bet it didn't make any sense when the prophet's little servant girl uh, said to Naaman that if you want to be cleansed of leprosy, you need to go dip down in the dirty waters of the Jordan River seven times. But friend, when he dipped down not one, two, three, four, five, or six times, when he dipped down in obedience the seventh time, as crazy as it seemed, he came up clean on the other side. I don't think it made any sense when the prophet told the woman, instead of making a little hoe cake of cornbread for yourself and for your son, make a, make a biscuit for me first. But brother, I'm telling you, when she obeyed the word of God, she was blessed on the other side of it. I don't think it made any sense. When Joshua told the priest, bear up the ark of the covenant upon your shoulders and step into the waters of the Jordan. Jordan at flood stage. But when they obeyed what God had declared, they saw a mighty move of the power of God. When Joshua said, here's how we're going to take Jericho, just march around seven times and then shout because the Lord has given us this city. It didn't make any sense when they started off on that march. But friend, when the walls came tumbling, tumbling down, they would say, it's good advice. Whatever God tells you to do, just flat do it. Hey, when you've lost your job, it doesn't make any sense to the unsaved world for you to have peace in your soul. When you've been told you've got cancer by the doctor, it doesn't make any sense to the unregenerate mind to have trust and faith in God. When you've buried a loved one, it doesn't make any sense to leave the cemetery, yes, with tears in your eyes, but also with hope and joy and anticipation in your heart. But if you know the one who is the resurrection and the life, you know it makes sense to do what God tells you to do. And most of all, it makes no sense for somebody to tell you that if you want to be forgiven of your sin, you've got to place your faith where God put your sin on the nail-scarred Nazarene carpenter named Jesus. But friend, anybody and everybody that's ever called on him by grace through faith would say it may have sounded crazy at first but when I did it I'm telling you my sins were forgiven my past was uh, re removed and my future has been settled Mary gave some wonderful wonderful advice whatever Jesus tells you to do just do it and beloved I tell you we ought to do it even when it seems crazy we ought to obey him as crazy as it seems but also, we ought to obey him no matter how costly it seems. The Bible gives us a little footnote here to tell us there were six water pots, and they contained upwards of 30 gallons each. Now, you do the math, that's 180 gallons. That's 36 five-gallon buckets absolutely filled with water. But may I remind you, they didn't have a spigot and a water hose from the Ace Hardware. They didn't have a five-gallon bucket in that day. I'm telling you, as much work as it would take for us in our day to go fetch 180 gallons of water and fill six 30-gallon water pots, it took far, far more work in their day, but they were willing to do it. Again, listen now, with no indication whatsoever of what God the Son was going to do on the other side of their obedience. It was a costly act of obedience for them to do whatever Jesus told them to do. If you're taking notes, you may jot a reference to Luke chapter 14. There in several ways in parables, the, the good teacher talks about the high cost of discipleship. Now, friends, I'm here to tell you today that salvation is absolutely free by the marvelous grace that we just sang about. But following Jesus has never been designed to be or intended to be convenient. It is going to be costly to do whatever Jesus tells you to do. Could it be that on this Sunday morning, as some of you are sitting in the bed and some of you are on your couch, uh, some of you are maybe on the back porch watching this service in a convenient spot, could it be that you have begun to grow comfortable with this new convenient Christianity? Now, I've already said how grateful I am for the technology we have in this day, and it's the, it's the only way that we can gather together as a church around the Word of God. But I want to ask you, would you make a commitment right now when the doors of this church reopen, 
When we come together once again to lift our hearts and our voices in worship to God and in the study of His Word, would you say no matter how inconvenient it is, no matter the price I have to pay, the cost I have to give, the sacrifice I have to render, I will do it to simply do whatever Jesus tells me to do? Oh, friend, that's just a little taste of the high cost of following Jesus. For you see, when you make up your mind that you're going to do whatever Jesus tells you to do, it won't be long before it's going to cost you something. It may cost you a job. It may cost you a promotion. It may cost you standing on the, on the club or the ball team. It may cost you uh, your pride. Young lady, it may cost you a relationship. When that good-for-nothing boyfriend of yours says, if you love me, you'll do this or you'll do that, you tell him, hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more, no more, no more, no more. Oh, it's going to cost you something to do whatever Jesus tells you to do. And by the way, if you're worried about what other people think about your obedience to Jesus, may I remind you that when Noah and his family got on the ark, they were in the overwhelming minority. But when the rain stopped and the flood water subsided, they were in a 100% majority. Oh, this is wonderful advice. Don't just do some of the stuff Jesus tells you to do. Don't just do a lot of the stuff or even most of the stuff Jesus tells you to do. You want some good advice from your mother and from your pastor. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, just do it. The scope of this advice. There's a second main truth I want you to notice in this text, and that that is the specifics of this advice. Exactly what is it that Mary tells these servants to do? She says, whatever he says. Whatever Jesus says. I heard about two men. They were neighbors, and one man came to the other, and he said, hey, my dog's got the mange. And I remember about a month ago, your dog had the mange. What did you, what did you do for him? And the second man said, well, I fed my dog motor oil. And he lapped it up. And so the man went back to his house, and he came back about three days later, and he said, man, I'm mad with you. You killed my dog. I gave my dog motor oil for the mange, and he dropped over Dornell dead. And the second man said, well, don't blame me. I did it, and my dog died too. Friend, you better be careful who you get your advice from. But when Mary gives this advice, she doesn't say, do whatever the head waiter tells you to do. She doesn't say, do whatever the bridegroom says. Do whatever the bride says. She says, as she points her finger, I believe, at the sinless son of the living God, whatever he says for you to do, do it. Now, that's great advice. Now, it involves a couple of things I think we can see in those two little words, he says, whatever he says. First of all, it involves the Savior, whatever he says. Now, God has established authority and advisors in our life, and it's always good for us to take good advice and to yield and submit to authorities. Hey, kids, it's always God's will for you to obey your mom and your dad in the Lord. It's good advice for all of us of any age to obey and submit to the police. It's good advice for us to obey the school teacher and the principal. If you've got a job, it's good advice for you to obey your supervisor, your boss, your employer. But the reality is all of those are just mere human beings, and they can be wrong. We should honor them and respect them even when we believe that they are wrong. But this advice involves the Savior. Whatever he, whatever Jesus says. Now, I think that's great advice because Mary is advising you to follow the counsel and obey the instruction of a man who has never been wrong. He was never wrong in word, never wrong in thought, never wrong in action. Now, in my ministry, I have a lot of people come to me. Uh, They'll call, they'll text, they'll stop by the office, or I'll visit in their home. And they will ask me my advice. They'll seek out my counsel as a pastor. And the truth is, when I give you counsel, you can take it or you can leave it. And the truth is, most people leave it and don't take it. But friend, you'll always be well advised to take the advice of the God-man. One who has all wisdom, all knowledge, all intellect. 
One who loves you with an everlasting love, who set his affection upon you and then demonstrated that love by climbing up on a skull-shaped mountain to die on the cross for your sin. Somebody who knows that much, who loves you that much, hey friend, he'll always give you wonderful advice. Whatever he says to you, do it. This, this advice involves the Savior. But note, secondly, it involves the Scripture. The scripture. For the text says, whatever he says, whatever God says to you, do it. Now, as I prepared my heart and this message this week, over and over again, I found myself singing what I know as hymn number 409. In our Baptist hymnal we have here in our church, number 409 is simply labeled, Trust and Obey. You know the the chorus of that song, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Well, that wonderful old song begins with these words. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. You see, the hymn writer knew that in order to be happy in Jesus, you've got to trust and obey. And in order to fully trust and fully obey, you've got to walk in the light of His Word. Now, we live in a day, because of Christian television and and the accessibility of religious podcasts, that I need to make a very important distinction. When I say do whatever God says, I'm not talking about some vision you've got in the night. I'm not talking about a dream you had around the midnight hour. That may be the flu. It may be uh, uh, Cerchero's that you picked up curbside. It may be some pepperoni pizza you had delivered by no touch from Domino's. But when you want to know for sure something that God has said, you've got to look into his word. In fact, I submit to you today that the only thing that we know for certain God has said is what God has said to us in His Word. That's why it's often been said that if you really want to hear the voice of God, I'm talking about the audible voice of God, what you need to do is open up your Bible and read it out loud. And you will hear with human ears the voice of God speaking to you. Now, does God still speak to his children by the movement of his spirit? Absolutely, he does. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. Does God speak to his children through uh, wise advice? Absolutely. The Bible says in a multitude of counsel, there is safety in that if you want to walk with the, want to be wise, you need to walk with the wise. God does speak by his spirit. God does speak through counsel and advice from others. Does God speak through the confirmation of signs and circumstances? Indeed, he does. But it is always, listen to me, always consistent with his word. So if you're going to do whatever he says, best thing for you to do is take down the blessed book of God and open up the Holy Bible and see what God has said. I'll say it again. There's only one source that we know for a fact is what God has said, and that is God's Word. This is one reason, for example, why we've put so much focus and attention on worship services like this one and the proclamation of God's Word. This is why with our children, we emphasize Awana and the memorization of Scripture, hiding the Word of God in our heart. This is why we focus so much on Sunday school. And I hope you're missing your Sunday school class and making every intention to be back in Sunday school just as soon as we put that back on our worship schedule. You and I need to hide the Word of God in our heart, not only so that we won't sin against God, but so that we can know what God has said and what God has declared for us to do. You won't do whatever he says if you don't know what he says, and you won't know what he says unless you know what he has already said. One great hymn writer put it this way, What more can he say than to you he hath said? How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. All the specifics of this advice. It involves the Savior. It involves the Scripture. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to ask you a question. How important to you is the Word of God? You know, in these days of COVID-19, we've become familiar with a lot of new phrases. Social distancing. Uh, We've learned words like 
pandemic. Some of you were not familiar with that word before. We've talked about uh, executive orders and guidelines. But one phrase that has become part of our culture in the last several weeks is the idea of an essential business or an essential activity. You know, when the uh, leaders first started ordering these shelter at homes, they exempted a number of businesses and industries they called essential businesses. Things like the grocery store, the the gas station, even home improvement stores uh, so that we can continue to run our lives and the affairs of our home. And we're so grateful for all those who have continued to work in these essential businesses. But did you know in most jurisdictions, church was not listed as an essential business? Uh, Some weeks ago when Governor Greg Abbott of the state of Texas listed church worship services as an essential business. I mean, conservative Christians uh, uh, like members of this church all across the country started praising and lauding. They started tweeting and they they started liking and sharing words of, of gratitude for Governor Greg Abbott that he had declared church services to be an essential place of operation. It was an essential activity. But I could not help but notice that many of those that were praising Governor Abbott for declaring church services to be essential are not that faithful to come to church themselves. Do you consider the gathering of God's people, the praise of God's Son, and the study of God's Word to be an essential part of who you are and what God has called you to do? Oh, friend, even though we're not able to come together in a Sunday school class, Even though we're not able to come together in this beautiful sanctuary to worship, wherever you are and wherever you go this week, you ought to find a place where you bow your heart and you bend your knee in prayer and you talk to God. And you better find you a Bible or a good Bible app and open up the Word of God because you'll never do whatever He says to you if you don't know what He says to you through His Word. Oh, this is wonderful advice. Whatever he says. These words speak to us, first of all, about the scope of this advice. The specifics of this advice. Thirdly and finally, I want to say a note about the simplicity of this advice. This is actually very simple advice. You don't have to be a brain surgeon to figure this out. In fact, our good friend evangelist David Miller will often humorously say, Friends, this is simple. This ain't rocket surgery. (laughs) Now, he knows uh, exactly what he's saying. He says that like I do to see if you're listening. He says, "This, this ain't rocket surgery. This is actually very, very simple. You don't have to have a Ph.D. in theology to understand the advice that Mary's giving and that I'm giving to you this morning. It's as simple and clear as red ink on white paper. Whatever he says to you, do it. And then when Jesus began to speak, listen to me now, the servants at that wedding at Cana of Galilee, they simply obeyed. Now, very often when we face challenges and questions in life, people start asking, what is the will of God for my life? That's not a bad question to ask. What is the will of God for my life? Many of our high school seniors, even our college graduates, you're missing graduation ceremonies, but don't miss this question. God, what is it that you want me to do? What do you want me to be? Where do you want me to live? How do you wish for me to serve? That's not a bad question. In fact, that's an excellent question. God, what is your will for my life? But let me tell you how you answer that question question. How do I answer the question, God, what is your will for my life? It's by backing up and simply saying, Lord, what is your will? God, what are your commandments? What have you mandated me to do or not do in your word? That's just real simple advice to listen to what he tells you to do and then do it. Did you notice what these servants did? Jesus said, get some water and fill up those water pots to the brim. And that's what they did. Then he said, take some of that water, draw it out and go give it to the head waiter. And that's exactly what they did. He spoke and they obeyed. It's really just that simple. Now, as we conclude this message today, examining the simplicity of this advice, I think that it involves two basic things. First, listen to what he says. Listen 
to what he says. Mary gives this advice, whatever he says, listen to this, to you. Not what he's saying to someone else, but whatever he says to you. Now, I'm very glad that Jesus listens to me when I pray. The Bible says in Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me, God says, call to me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Jesus said, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open to you. There are wonderful promises in the word of God that Jesus hears us when we pray. But friend, this text is not about prayer. This text is about obedience. This sermon, this passage is not about God listening to us when we speak. (laughs) It's about us listening to God when he speaks. Whatever he says to you. Now I need you to pay very close attention to to a doctrinal point that I need to make today. This whole conversation, this dialogue at the wedding at Cana of Galilee began with Mary coming to tell Jesus about a problem. Many commentators believe that this bride and groom were probably family friends of of Mary and Joseph's family. Mary seems to have taken on some sense of burden or responsibility for the shortage of wine. So she comes to her son, the Lord Jesus, and she says, there's a problem back in the kitchen. (laughs) We've run out of wine. By implication, listen, she comes and says, Jesus, do something. And Jesus gave a, a rather unusual response. In fact, scholars and Bible commentators are all over the map about what Jesus said in response. At, at first glance, at first reading, it seems almost disrespectful. Woman, what does that have to do with us, some translations say, what does that have to do with me? Now, I want to be very clear. Jesus was not being disrespectful to his mother when he called her woman. Now, here in the South, uh, sir, I would not advise you to call your wife. And kids, I would not advise you to call your mama woman. You may draw back a nub. You may find out that you need to go to the dentist and get some dental implants. We, we use that word woman in a disrespectful way, like hush up, woman. That's certainly not how Jesus used this word. Jesus obeyed every commandment. The sinless one never dishonored or disrespected his mother. In fact, this word woman here is a term of endearment. It's a term of respect. We might use the word ma'am or even the word lady. Ma'am, what does that have to do with me? This is the same word woman that Jesus used when he was dying on the cross and respectfully said to his mother, woman, behold thy son. So Jesus is speaking in a respectful way, but what is he asking and what is he communicating? He said, woman, what does that wine shortage have to do with us or with me? My hour has not yet come. That phrase, my hour, is a, is a word, a phrase that John will use throughout the pages of this fourth gospel. And it is in reference to the coming death, burial, and glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, the time is not right for me to put my glory fully on display. Now, now here's what all of this means. Mary came to Jesus asking him to do something. And Jesus said, the time is not right yet for me to do what you really need me to to do. Jesus did not give her an immediate answer to her question. Now, it's not that he isn't going to do anything about the wine shortage. That's very obvious from the balance of this text. But, but you need to watch very closely. When Mary came to Jesus asking him to do something, Jesus did not respond the way she wanted him to respond. But when Mary's heart was touched, I believe, by the Spirit of God, and she turned to the servants and said, Whatever he says to you, do it. The Bible says in this text that the glory of Almighty God was put on display through this creative miracle of transformation. You say, preacher, what does that have to do with me following this advice? Friend, I'm grateful that God hears my prayers and listens to my requests. He invites me throughout his word to bring my petitions and my requests to him. But you really want to get the attention of heaven? 
When you get through taking your request to God for him to hear, why don't you turn that thing around and say, speak now, Lord, for I, your servant, I am listening. I haven't just come to tell you what I want you to do, but Lord, I want to follow some advice that your own mama gave to me. Whatever you've said for me to do, I aim to do it. Oh, friend, if you want to get in on this great advice, you've got to listen to what he says. Did you catch it? Mary comes and says, do something, and nothing happens. Then she says, Jesus, you tell us what to do, and we'll do it. And the glory of God is revealed. Oh, friend, here's some good advice. Listen to what he says. But finally today, we see not only to listen to what he says, but live out what he says says. Did you catch it in this great mother's advice? She did not say whatever he says to you, believe it, as important as belief is. She did not say whatever he says to you, agree with it, as important as it is that we come into agreement with the Word of God. No, she puts it in shoe leather practical terminology. Whatever he says to you, do it. Don't amen it, don't clap about it, don't shout about it, don't plan on it, don't prognosticate about it, don't sit around and debate about it, but whatever Jesus Christ tells you to do, you want some good advice, get up and get busy about doing it. Now, if Mary had been around when Brother James wrote his little book of the Bible, long about chapter 2 when he says that, Faith without works is dead. Mary was a godly, quiet woman, but I believe she would have hushed out or whispered, Amen. Preach it, Brother James. Does no good to say what you believe if you won't act on it. Oh, friend, whatever he says to you, do it. Later in life, when the Apostle John, who was at this wedding, the author of this very book, In his first epistle to the church, he said in chapter 2, I believe it is, that the one who says, I've come to know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. I believe that Mary would have said, John, that's exactly what I was trying to get those servants to understand back at that wedding at Cana of Galilee. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, get busy about doing it. Don't just listen to what he says. Live out what he says. Now, I've called this the simplicity of this advice because sometimes when God tells us through his word and by his spirit what we are to do, sometimes it's not easy to do it. It's not easy to go and ask for forgiveness. It's not easy to forgive. It's not the easiest thing in the world to give a sacrificial offering to God out of what we believe is our own personal lack of resources. It's not easy to keep your hand to the plow of being a a parent. On this Mother's Day, some of you stay at home mamas and some of you work uh, mothers are, I mean, you're, you're, you're fried and frazzled. This coronavirus stay at home cancellation of schools has given you a workload like most of us could never even imagine. May God bless you, but I'm telling you, it's not always easy to do what God tells us to do, but it's not hard to know what he tells us to do. And here in this text, Mary gives some wonderful advice. Whatever he says to you, do it. Most of you are familiar with the Nike Athletic Company. Nike has been around since the early 70s. In fact, they literally ran onto the scene in the 1972 Olympics. And they have one of the most recognizable corporate logos in the world. You're very familiar with the Starbucks logo and the golden arches of McDonald's. And most of you could recognize that famous Nike swoosh. Well, since 1972, Nike has been one of the biggest athletic uh, uh, companies in the entire world. 
They, they, they shot to stardom in the mid-80s when they got Michael Jordan to put his name on some special shoes they had made for him. They made them available to the public in 1985, and, and, and even today you can buy some Air Jordans. But around the late 1980s, Nike fell from its number one spot in the athletic industry. Uh, the competition was stiff, and the competition was fierce, and Nike fell out of that top spot. Corporate advertising executives came together, and they began to wrestle, and they began to brainstorm. They had all of their strategy sessions, and finally somebody came up with the brilliant idea, and that idea was implemented, and it shot Nike right back up to the top of the pile. Their advertising slogan, you're very familiar with it, just three little words, just do it. Now, what they had in mind is uh, you need to get in shape. Don't make any excuses. Don't give all the reasons why it can't happen. Just do it. Go for the gold. Reach the brass ring. Climb for the top. Win the trophy. Just do it. Well, as great as that corporate slogan is, quite frankly, Nike could be sued for plagiarism because Nike didn't come up with that. That advice is at least 2,000 years old. It appeared first at the wedding at Cana of Galilee when Mary said to the servants that day, what I'm saying to you, whatever Jesus tells you to do, just do it. Friend, I don't know what it is that Jesus might be telling some of you to do today. Perhaps you've never been saved. You've never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. You've never repented of your sin and become a Christian. I know for a fact Jesus would say to you today, repent and believe the gospel. He said of himself, any man that will come to me, I will in no wise cast him out. If you'll come, Jesus will receive you. Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. I know for a fact if you've never been saved today, Jesus desires for you to come. Why don't you just do it? Just come to him in repentant faith and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for me. I am confident you rose from the dead. I ask you to forgive my sin. I ask you to save me. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus Christ. And I promise today by your strength, I will live for you. If you've never been saved right there where you are, I'm telling you what Jesus is saying to you. He's saying to you, come to me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me and I will forgive your sin. Someone else, there's another act of obedience you have in your life. I don't have time or knowledge to go down the list of all the things that it could be. But I would tell you, if through the study of the Word of God, the Holy Spirit has revealed to you that there's something that you're doing that you need to stop, or you're not doing and you need to start, here's some of the best advice that any mother ever gave. I want to give it to you today. Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emanuel Pulpit.